Um, this thing seems to again be really finicky. So we'll again probably have issues where slides disappear. So bear with me if that happens. Uh, but yeah, uh, let, let's see first whether there are any questions about the second homework. You are suffering with the autograder, but I'm also suffering with the autograder. So the pain is shared. Um, I sent an announcement this morning. Uh, you might be implementing batching. Uh, we might be flagging you your batching incorrectly as not implemented. If that's happening, just be sure that your batching actually works locally and that you are getting, uh, you know, working that you have working code with batching. And then um, when we release the grade, you will have an option to request regrading, and then we'll look into whether manually, whether you have implemented it and uh, fix the uh, deduction that we have given you. This helps us at least cover some of the big portion of the homeworks automatically. And then for uh, a few of you, unfortunately, we'll need to do this manually. So that's the best we have figured out right now. For some bonus uh, solutions, we have been getting runtime errors. So uh, check your, if you are submitting bonus, uh, check whether you can actually, um, you know, avoid getting uh, runtime issues and uh, resubmit your code when you, when you uh, fix uh, whatever needs to be fixed. Any other questions about the homework? Okay, good. Hopefully, you are not stuck. All right, so last time we were talking about uh, transformer architecture and we didn't really finish uh, talking about everything there is to say about transformer. Uh, remember, a, a transformer has uh, is consisting of encoder and uh, decoder. So this is encoder, which we had covered last time almost fully. And then uh, there is a decoder part that's very alike encoder. So we won't need to introduce many new details, but uh, we should go over it nevertheless. Um, I do want to go over the you know components of the encoder as well. Uh, again, just to be sure we are on the same page. Uh, so remember, we had given as an input our sentence. The sentence had to be tokenized as always. Tokens are replaced by indices in the vocabulary. And then uh, these indices are used to retrieve the corresponding rows in the embedding matrix to get a vector representation for every single token in our input. And a new thing that we have introduced with transformers is positional encoding, where uh, we are also uh, adding to the embedding of a token, like embedding of the token the, we are adding the embedding for uh, its position in the given sentence. So if this uh, token had appeared in the uh, you know, as the tenth token in this sentence, we would sum um, an embedding for position number 10, which I said is a little bit wonky because we are using these highly dimensional vectors to represent integers, but that's a one way to kind of integrate this uh, information. And then we had our very complex multi-headed self attention, right? Uh, where idea is that now we are going to produce a new representation of each token, which will be highly contextualized with respect to other tokens in the input due to the self-attention, which uh, measured this token by token importance mm -hmm. scores, and then had contextualized each token's representations by using some of the other token's representations, uh, depending on how important they were for a given token. So the output of multi-headed self-attention is a, is a representation of the same size we began with, and uh, but it's now highly, highly contextualized. Um, I also shared in an announcement a short video for, that you can check uh, where I kind of um, actually did the vector matrix multiplications. Uh, that might be helpful if this idea of how this uh, importances and then mixing and contextualizing of information uh, had emerged. I tried to do that on the whiteboard, but um, just in case you need to go over all of that again, uh, check out that uh, video I shared in the announcement. After the output of self-attention, which is now gives us a token uh, re representation uh, for each, excuse me, representation for each token that's highly contextualized, uh, we have um, a feed forward a neural uh, network here. Uh, they use um, MLPs for multi-layer perceptron. That's the same thing. Um, and uh, yeah, basically we take the 
here the X uh, represents the output of the self-attention and uh, you are applying linear transformation, applying non-linearity here, GELU, and then uh, another linear uh, transformation. And kind of the idea here is that uh, there, there is an extra layer of um, expressivenesses here for from the model where it can kind of ponder uh, for itself about what it has observed previously. But as I said, these are just intuitions that we kind of build. Um, and the evidence for these kinds of intuitions are not as strong. Um, and I also mentioned that this is where the bulk of parameters happen. This is where uh, we can, by do linear transformation that uh, produces something, some vector that's huge. And then by multiplying with this linear transformation, we kind of decrease it back to the size of uh, that we started with. And then there are two extra things, uh, residual connections. As I said, this is just one of the tools in your toolbox, uh, deep learning toolbox, uh, residual connection or a skip connection. It's not super specific trans transformers. Uh, you, you will see it in convolutional neural networks as well. The idea being that you do not want to forget the information you started with. So you upon, like after all of these transformations, you get a new representation of a token, but then you sum it with the original representation of the token you started with. And in this way you are capturing uh, both of these informations. All right, so uh, here module XI just means like this is the module XI, module is whatever was the previous, uh, previous uh, layer. Okay, and then there is a layer norm. Again, layer norm is not specific to transformers. You can use it in other architectures. Excuse me, if you're on Zoom, please um, mute yourself such that we don't get the noise. Um, I won't be able to uh, get the questions from the chat in Zoom while I'm teaching in person. Um, maybe I can crank it up the volume just in case you wanna ask something. Um, so yeah. Um, Layer norm, I didn't, uh, I realized maybe I used layer norm last time as you should know about it, which then I realized you maybe don't know what layer norm is. Layer norm is um, a method where you take any vector and here we are taking the outputs of our layers. Uh, you take that vector and you want to uh, normalize its values. So the values in these vectors can be really high and really, really low. And that's going to be an issue for training neural network because your gradient is are going to vary a lot for the values over here uh, or in that vector. And that's not going to be great for our gradient descent because it's going to make the step sizes we are taking uneven. So what we do is we compute the mean and standard deviations of the values in that vector. And then uh, this operation here, uh, vector minus its mean uh, divided by the standard deviation. What the, uh, this is going to uh, produce a vector that's going to be of uh, zero norm and standard deviation one. Uh, however, with uh, layer normalization and neural network, we also have two learnable parameters, gamma and beta. These parameters are learned through with network training. Uh, so they are not hyperparameters, but rather parameters or weights. And the idea behind gamma and beta is that, well, maybe uh, forcing that the standard deviation is exactly one is a little bit too harsh. So we are gonna let the network decide like how much, like we should center around zero, but how much is up to the network. So uh, this is the idea behind the uh, layer norm. Before normalizations, values vary. That's going to give us unstable training. We are applying uh, normalization to, to uh, avoid that. OK, so that's it. That gives us the whole stack for uh, our, um, our um, encoder. And as I said, this represents only one encoder block, and we have a stack of these. So all of these operations I just went over again. Uh, will be repeated however blocks you have in the encoder. And the number of blocks for a small transformer would be six. For a, what has been a large transformer in 2018 would be 12. And today uh, is even larger. OK, and the output of the encoder block uh, give, is the token representation, each token's representation, which is now highly uh, highly contextualized, meaning it contains information about the other uh, tokens in the input. 
Um, and so far, we didn't talk about decoder, right? So we just have the representation of each token in the input, and now we can go about doing, uh, you know, decoding. Okay, so I want to go uh, over transformer decoder, which I didn't talk about last time, but are there any questions about transformer encoder? All right, let's move on then. Don't be shy and ask me questions about, I mean, I understand this is now a way more complex neural network. So yeah, feel free to really ask whatever uh, comes to your mind. Um, so decoding, um, here we wanna do the standard like conditional language modeling part, right? We have these representations of our source tokens, and now we wanna start to uh, to generate uh, whatever we wanna, we aim to do, like maybe a translation of a sentence. Um, I'm reusing someone else's slides here. You have seen everything that's written here. This is just the uh, language modeling uh, portion. All right, so let me skip uh, to two main parts. The, in the first decoder block, we are still going to do our self-attention, uh, but now uh, we have um, maybe decoded only as three words so far, three tokens, and we are going to attend to those three tokens. Um, the thing is that we do not know which tokens we should like, uh, during training, we have our input text and we are trying to reproduce it. So in theory, we know what comes uh, next. Uh, but when we do this uh, self-attention, we don't want our self-attention to attend to the future tokens because we, in theory, don't know what the next tokens are. So we have so-called mask attention, where you basically set the uh, uh, attention values of a given token to the future tokens to be zero. So you set it manually. And this is going to co be called in, uh, you know, transformers in Hugging Face, uh, it says library uh, attention underscore mask. So you will see these variables that uh, 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 are going to uh, force that these values are zero. But the, uh, this, the computations themselves stay the same. Um, okay. At the generation time, we can't do such um, such a trick. Remember, at the generation time, we actually have no idea what comes next. So we can't, uh, 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 you know, uh, do this. We are actually decoding one token at a time and and uh, having, you know, uh, a matrix of a corresponding size. Um, after we have done this. Um, mask self-attention within the tokens that have been generated so far, we also want to attend to the tokens that come uh, that have uh, appeared in the encoder. So in this uh, uh, attention, we are attending also to uh, the tokens that were that were produced by the encoder. So here at the end of encoder, we have some representations and this attention is also going to attend to those. This is, more precisely called cross attention, but because um, self attention and transform like attention in transformers is now kind of um, what we use, we call all of these things attention. So if you want to really be specific, you you have to say, oh, I mean cross attention rather than self attention. But people will just say attention among uh, each other and won't make a huge difference because computations are basically the same. It's just a matter of what are the uh, vectors that you are attending to? Um, all right, and then again, you have your feed forward layers, you have your residual connection layer norm, and uh, the final output layer is what you have seen with neural language modeling and with neural machine translation. You have an output matrix, which will be of the size of the dimension of your representation times the number of words in the vocabulary, you're gonna get the vector of the size of the number of vocabulary, apply softmax and uh, predict, um, depending on what kind of uh, decoding strategy you deploy, you are going to sample maybe from that uh, distribution over vocabulary. So basically that's it. Uh, that's the whole uh, transformer. Um, a lot of this is kind of uh, repeating itself. That's why that 
very high level abstraction of these are just encode stack of encoder decoder blocks is helpful. And each of these encoder decoder blocks itself consists of self attention or cross attention and uh, feed forward layers with the residual connection and the layer normalization. Okay, um, again, any questions about any of these components that are, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah, you do, exactly. Because remember, as you are decoding, for a given decoding step, some encoder tokens are gonna be more important than others. And then when you move to another decoding steps, this distribution over encoded, over source tokens is gonna to differ. Yeah. Think always, I think it's useful to think about translation because it's kind of it's clear that there is this word to word or phrase to phrase alignment. So I, I think that helps. Yeah. Do you usually have more encoding or decoding blocks you're leaving there about the same? Uh sorry, uh, uh, decoding steps or like, like blocks. Oh, blocks. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know by heart. I would expect them to be the same. Um, I don't know why one one would be deeper than the other, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. So my bet is they are the same, but they might be slightly different too. Yeah. And here in this original figure, I see N and N. So it kind of suggests that I'm right, but uh, yeah, not 100% not sure. Okay, cool. Well, I'm excited for you. You learn what transformers are, uh, which is uh, which is important. Um, one uh, one thing I want to mention is that uh, the original transformer was proposed as encoder decoder, but today we people have uh, said, well, uh, I don't care about the encoder part, so I'm gonna ditch encoder. Uh, for example, maybe you care just about neural language modeling. So why do you need the encoder part, right? You you just don't care about it. Um, uh, but even for conditional, for conditional um, language modeling or te conditional text generation, you can first hear uh, whatever is your you know source sequence you can start encoding it with the decoder nothing will happen if you do that and then you just continue uh, generating um there are also encoder only models where that we are going to talk about more today where you just care about the encoder part you really want to have a good representation of your sequence encoder gives you a representation of every single token so that's it right right like you got the exact representation you need you just need to maybe slap uh, additional uh, layers on top of it to make the prediction you want and then there are encoder decoders t5 is uh, the most uh, prominent example of encoder decoder transformer that's uh, in the exact shape we have seen <laughs> so yeah, today we are going to talk about pre-training these transformers, and then uh, the two common choices for pre-training will be kind of suggestive of using decoder only or encoder only models. So we are going to talk a little bit more uh, about all of this. For a moment, you just need to remember that not every transformer is encoder decoder transformer. And Transformer, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, had become the standard architecture for many, many, many tasks, uh, from computer vision to speech recognition to reinforcement learning. This is the uh, the architecture of choice. So uh, I really like this title that says, anything you can talk tokenize, you can feed to Transformer. So that idea of tokenization that we have talked about before is now something we even you know, apply to different modalities, which is very different from the where the tokenization has started with. Remember, I give you a new citation from the 90s. That's not what the people in the 90s probably thought about when they thought about tokenization the way we do it today. But yeah, today you will take an image, you will um, uh, tokenize that image into a patches. You basically make a grid over the image and every single patch will be your token. And every single smaller patch of that image will be represented with a vector, a like token embedding. And then everything else 
stays the same. As long as you have a sequence of embeddings to shove into your transformer, you can use transformer. So vision, uh, so images turn into a sequence of vectors, speech, sequence of vectors, and so on. And this ties back to what I told you before about how some of these things are slightly disappointing. Now you represent image with a sequence of these vector, like vectors that each one of them represents a patch and then you're learning important scores between patches. It works, it works really well, but some, maybe it doesn't really fit your intuition of how we should uh, model these things. And you, you are not alone if you feel like that, yeah. So for language and speech, it makes sense that you split all the same images. Yeah. Kind of sequence how it works. But for images, how does, when you split that image into sequence of tokens, how does it generate? Like yeah, uh, so you still have your positional embeddings and how you make your positional embeddings is different. So each patch of your image can be, can, has basically four coordinates and you can use those four coordinates um, you know, for each edge of the image uh, and uh, put them in a sequence and then multiply it by a learn matrix that gives you a representation of those four coordinates. It's again, wonky idea to, you know, transform, you have four, num four two dimensional numbers and now you're transforming it into high dimensional vector just to represent a position, but that's what people uh, do. I don't know what that. That's definitely what we did in twenty twenty. I don't re don't know exactly what people do today, because the space of positional encodings is changing, and it works. I mean, again, not super. I would say, it's a it's a hacky idea to try uh, for sure. I mean, I can imagine a lot of people thinking of it, but um, is it elegant? It's not. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so you will see Transformer everywhere you go if you stick around with machine learning uh, long enough. Um, but yeah, I want to now take a, a few steps back and revisit a few things because I have promised you that we will fix a lot of things with Transformers. So let's let's talk about those problems we have talked about when we were talking about deep averaging uh, neural network. So reminder that I have told you that one of the issues with the static embeddings like blob and word to vec is that regardless of the actual sense of the word, we are representing it with the exact same embedding. So uh, I've given you this example of the word basing that has completely different senses in these three sentences. But uh, if we were uh, approaching modeling of this sequence with, uh, let's say, deep averaging neural network, we would represent basing with the same glove vector, and then we would average uh, the uh, this embedding with the others embeddings in the sequence. Uh, so that that wasn't great. And uh, right now, maybe it's not entirely didn't come entirely to your head yet. But now, after the uh, this whole a bunch of transformation with the encoder transformer uh, due to self-attention that mm, results in mixing of token embeddings of uh, different tokens in the input depending on their pairwise important scores. What you end up with in the end is a contextual representation of a token. So here, the last layer will in the encoder transformer will give us representation of Bayesian that's different than here and here because the representation was built by uh, representations of these other tokens, which differ in these three sentences. So that's very important that now the representations we are getting uh, for these tokens are highly contextualized and therefore highly different. Um, is that clear? This is this is really important. So I just want to make sure that is that makes sense. Uh, and maybe I didn't emphasize enough, the first layer uh, we start with in Transformer, we'll start again with the static embeddings. Uh, usually we don't use GLAV or worth 2 ec or whatever. Uh, now today we are going to talk about pre-training uh, where we are going to train this Transformer model and then the embeddings we start will, will be learned through pre-training. Um, so typically today you're not going to use word to work with transformer. That's not going to work because remember residual connections, for example, you need to have the exact same dimension you started with uh, to sum it with a representation that is uh, output of each encoder or decoder block. 
So if you are stuck with the 50 or 300 dimensional vectors like we are with glove or where to work, then that limits the choices you can make when you are designing your transformer. And uh, we want to have larger sizes than 50 or 300. OK, is this clear? All righty. Uh, that was one thing, so we fixed that. The other problem was that we didn't really model that the order of tokens, um, the, the order they appear in with the deep averaging neural network. Uh, and we also, um, I, I told you that the long range dependencies are going to be an issue. So if you had a subject verb um, relation where, you know, like in German language, the verb comes very far from the subject at the very end of the sentence where the subject came in the beginning, uh, a lot of uh, like recurrent neural networks are going to have that issue. Although in theory, they shouldn't be having that issue. They should be remembering the whole history. In practice, they do have that issue. And with uh, transformers, this is modeled really well due to the self-attention. The self-attention attending, uh, each token attends, uh, has ability to attend to other token, regardless of how far away it is in a sentence, enables modeling these uh, long range dependencies, which then uh, enables transformer architecture to learn way more complex tasks, such as summarization of a very long document. That's not, uh, an issue for a transformer like it is for a recurrent neural network. And then uh, I talked about how uh, we are dealing with non-convex optimization, meaning that our loss function, it's not a convex function with respect to our parameters, uh, which means that our initialization matters. So like where we start is going to matter. If we start here, we are gonna end up here. If we start over here, we will end up here. So uh, it matters. And what we are going to talk about today, transformer itself didn't fix this for us. Transformer, if we randomly initialize its weights, uh, still has can suffer from you know, having poor initialization and we end up in a bad spot. So what we are going to talk about today is pre-training, the idea of taking a huge corpus of text like the entirety of the web right now, and then using that text and some kind of training objective that doesn't require human annotators to label that uh, text. Uh, and then we are gonna use those training objectives to uh, train this uh, ar architecture, this transformer to, to get some weights that are going to be uh, in a really nice spot in this landscape that enables us to later on uh, change these weights with a little bit of labeled data in a way uh, that uh, is um, better, like it enables the model to learn uh, this uh, task better than starting from a random initialization. So that's a high level, like what we are gonna talk about today, but when we are going to dwell into details. And just going back to, uh, shortly to our timeline, like I said, that um, we are now up on, until spring break, we're going to talk about these uh, recent advances that led to large language models. We have covered a transformer. So we are done with 2017. And what we are moving into is, uh, as I mentioned now, pre-training uh, of the model and fine tuning and models like BERT and GPT-2, which I had uh, briefly mentioned uh, before. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about pre-training. Uh, standard supervised deep learning, the one you have been implementing for your homework too, requires that you have some human label data. So if right now you're working with the sentiment classification data and you are given sentiment labels, right? You someone, some human annotators had said, this is a positive, this is a negative review. So you start with that and you start with randomly initialized neural network, right? Like all of you who have implemented the homework had us uh, use random initialization. You didn't start with some special, uh, special, um, you know, values in your matrices. And then you train your network, you try to predict, you get some loss, you use that loss to compute the gradient and you back propagate and change these weights until you are happy. And then um, you have a trained model. With pre-trained and fine-tuning, this, this is now a two-step procedure. In the stage one, 
we pre-train a model, which means we have some huge corpus of text unlabeled. So hum there is no human annotation over this text. And we have some neural network of choice, such as transformer. And then we decide, well, I, I want to I wanna change these parameters of this model um, in a way that might be helpful later on. But I do not want to label any of that data. I mean, this data has trillions of tokens. That would be, I mean, that would cost a lot of money to label that data. So you're opting for training objectives that do not require any data labeling. Does anything come to your mind? What kind of training objective could you use to change these parameters without labeling data? Say again. Uh, that's a that's a kind of general uh, you know family of the models that this this lies into. But I, I'm looking for a specific task here that you have learned about. Summarization requires that we have human written summaries. Self attention is not a task. Yeah. That's right. And how did we call that? That's true. So we, we start with, let's say, uh, first some token, and then we are, what are we trying to do next in your, in the, in the thing you are suggesting? There are ways which can somehow make it reproduce the context. So the, okay, L let's talk about inputs, outputs. What's the input and what's the output to your uh, task, for your task? Oh yeah, maybe the next yeah, like next, next one. yeah, based on the like, current input, what the next input, uh, the next prediction we can see in a given A, what's the next B? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you wanna what's the name of the task you just described? Language modeling. Language yeah. modeling, exactly. So we have one uh, one task, and sorry, you also raised the hand. I don't know whether you also want to say language modeling. Yeah. Okay, uh, so yeah, language model is, is one task, one, uh, one way to use large corpus of data uh, and use language modeling training objective to change the weights without ever labeling the data. Summarization is kind of like conditional language model, but it does require data which humans have produced it. With next word prediction, human doesn't need to intervene on this data at all. We can just scrape the web and predict the next word. So language modeling that we have seen is one way to do pre-training. Another way that we haven't talked about is so-called mask language modeling, which we will cover today, where instead of predicting next word, you randomly mask some tokens, and then you try to predict those tokens, having distributional hypothesis in mind. We know that, uh, that, um, that uh, if we know something about the context of the word that we might suggest which word uh, is missing. Um, so that's important that we have huge corpus and date and the objective where we don't need to label data uh, at all, or people do not need to be asked to produce uh, a label. So once we do that, and usually this is done by big companies like Google, Meta, OpenAI, uh, and so on, uh, they, they train this because this stage is these days takes a long time because now we are increasing our pre-training corpus to have uh, three trillions tokens, which is a lot of tokens. And your neural network architecture is such that you have at least 7 billion parameters uh, in the end. So uh, usually we train this for these days for like a couple of months. And I will, uh, if, I, if I get to it today, I will show you that all of the language models we have right now, pre-trained language models, under-trained. We didn't converge to zero loss, 
but usually what happens is that whoever is you know try, like decides to pre-train one of these they're like okay we need ton of gpus i mean the amount of gpus you need for this is is uh wild that's why only certain uh organizations can do this and usually also kind of like nvidia might tell you okay we're going to give you six months of GPUs, or you have like French government says, okay, I'm going to give you this cluster for six months. So you have usually a period of time when you can do this and you train the model in that given period of time that's determined by whoever leads the organization. So you are kind of, um, yeah, uh, you, you, you are bounded by those factors. And then once they are done, they share and this is now some organizations share, so others don't. For example, OpenAI doesn't share uh, the weights of its models. Meta is sharing the weights uh, of their models. Google is not sharing anymore. They had shared before and so on. So it's a who shares and who doesn't is, a, is an also dynamic space. But you take whoever had shared their weights and then um, you do exactly the same thing you have done before with your standard supervised machine learning exactly the same but instead of standing, starting with randomly initialized weights you are starting with these nice now nicely found weights through this pre-training stage so this stage where you take someone else's weights and you train the model starting from those weights this is called fine tuning and this procedure as i said before is called pre-training so for you who are using these pre-trained models, effectively nothing has changed. You just load those weights instead of random weights, uh, but those weights are way better than random weights because they put you in the nice spot in this uh, you know, loss uh, landscape. So when you fine tune your model from these weights, you get way better performance. Your model converges way faster than if you had started with the random initialized weights unless you are working with in a domain that's so particular, like ancient Greek, where pre-training, you didn't see that data and you that might not be useful. But even, the, even, even for that kind of really wide, like big gap, you might see some improvements because there is still a little bit of structure that you're learning. Okay, general idea clear, yep. For example, the pre training the moment before I hit the next order, you are 100% right. I wasn't precise enough. What I meant is that in fine tuning stage, you did you're doing exactly what you did, did with the standard supervised deep learning, and there you have negative log likelihood uh training, right? Uh, yeah, the objective here in pre training and fine tuning is usually different. But now with generative AI, it's not uh, necessarily different uh, too. Dep you can still approach classification as generation, which I'll, I'll talk about today. But you are completely right that the choice might be different between these two things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are, we are definitely stuck with transformers. That's whatever had uh you know people who pre-train models decide. That's that's what we are stuck with, and that might speak for why like the whole field converged to a single architecture too. Um, you might find better architecture proposal, but then you need to convince people to scale your. A proposal to these sizes and this costs a lot of money like pre-training these days costs millions so uh any you know forbes 100 company could do it so i'm not saying there is like three companies in the world who can do it i think there are a ton of companies who can pre-train models um but like two of us uh, if we are just working at the university that's not not an option so if you have a proposal for different architecture that you want someone to pre-train, then someone needs to make a bet on your proposal. And without pre-training, likely your architecture won't be sufficiently good to match other architecture that's pre-trained. Okay, so let's move on. Pre-training objective number one, as we said, language modeling. We have seen this. We have some text, we have corpus, we sample some text. Uh, for example, we sample an uh, Wikipedia article. 
or here an IMDb movie review that is available on the web. And uh, all we are trying to do is predict the next word as we have seen before. And that's all we are doing. Uh, remember here that the last layer is the, um, you know, the standard output layer where we have this huge matrix, which has the number of columns is the number of tokens in the, in the vocabulary. Uh, and as I hinted uh, when I was answering your questions, after pre-training, we can reuse this matrix if we cast every single task we have as a sequence to sequence task. So you're doing classification, but you are, instead of trying to uh, do whatever we were doing before, you're trying to generate your labels such as positive or negative. Um, so basically you approach classification, training a classifier as a training of a conditional language model where the, the model has to generate words such as positive or negative. Um, there, if you are fine tuning the model to do that, it will learn what the possible uh, output space is. So it won't start now generating, uh, you know, synonyms for negative like bad or synonyms for positive like good, which is an option if um, you don't fine tune. Um, if we are not fine tuning, something we'll talk about next week, then we might need to do extra things, which I don't want to talk about right now. So that's an approach for, you know, pre-training. You pre-train a model, a transformer model as a language model, and uh, you then approach every single task as a sequence to sequence task. Uh, this now have took off, uh, like all the models right now that are the standard models to use, approach uh, a classification in this manner. And this is why now conditional language modeling is called generative AI, because no matter what kind of a task pops in your mind, you you frame it as a sequence to sequence, you, you model it as conditional language modeling, and very often it works very well. And it enables you that you can always reuse this matrix, regardless of the task you have in mind. You don't need to add extra layers like we'll need with uh, another approach I will show you in a second. Um, models of this uh, that falls into these categories are GPT-2, 3, 4, uh, and open source uh, attempts of replication such as GPT-Neo or J. Uh, these are decoder-only transformers, meaning we have only decoder part and um, we pre-train them with language modeling. Um, GPT-2 comes up to size as 1.5 million. Um, GPT-3 is of the size 175 billion. GPT-4, we don't know. This is not a disclosed information. There are some gossip that it might be in, billion, in trillions, but that's also unlikely. And then someone has said 20 billion, which is way too small. So we, we don't really know. Um, Lama2 is uh, an open source uh, language, pre-trained language model that's been released last year. Uh, it comes in sizes 7 billion, uh, 13 billion, and 17 billion. It's base version, and I should rewrite here base to not confuse you with the next week's lecture. Um, never mind me. It's become clear why I did this uh, next week. Um, it comes up to size of 70 billion. And last year, when Meta has decided to release this, it kind of... Um, made this like another wave of uh, open sourcing language models. So today um, you have a ton of open source pre-trained language models. Um, if you search for Stanford foundational models ecosystems, they kind of keep track of them. Uh, yesterday scrolled and there were like dozens of them after Lama 2. Um, and the idea now is to get an open source model that's uh, as good as GPT-4. That doesn't happen yet. Uh, and GPT-4 is the base for JGPT uh, Pro version, if you have it. Uh, we can current open source language models, which are all you know, pre-trained with language modeling, and uh, all of them are decoder-only transformers. Um, they today we have some that are on par with the GPT uh, three point five, which is the Chat GPT. If you don't pay for the pro version, so this space of matching uh, matching the closed systems is kind of 
it's getting there, but then who knows what OpenAI has in house, you know, like by the time we match the performance, they might be uh, way better. So yeah, these are examples of models that are pre-trained electrical language modeling that are decoder only transformers. Um, questions about that? Yes. Just sort of encoder decoder stack and then the sort of models which are like decoder only or encoder only. Mm -hmm. so what exactly is the motivation for not doing both and doing only one? Yeah, that's a good question. So I can tell you for encoder only why, like the difference between encoder only and decoder only or encoder decoder. But the choice between decoder only and encoder decoder, uh, honestly, I don't know right now why exactly one is better than the other. What comes in mind is that if decoder only performs better, equally good as encoder decoder, then that's great because you have half the less parameters, right? Like you digit encoder, but you still can do everything better, which is important for scaling these things, right? Um, so I think that's probably why, but I'm not 100% sure that's also the entire, it's probably one of the reasons and I can't think of the others, yeah. Yep. Decoder only. So when you start with uh, pre-training, uh, pre you are doing language modeling, which means that you start with this uh, beginning of sequence token, uh, which is a special token that says starts uh, predicting the next word, and then it predicts the next word, and then you put it in the input and so on. Uh, when you are now doing a task post pre-training, you are fine tuning your model, you would approach it in the same way. So. If you are doing a translation, uh, you would start with a source semicolon, your source sentence, and um, you would put it in your decoder and it, you would get you know, the outputs, but you wouldn't really sample because you don't care what the model thinks is the next word in when you're you know, putting the sequence in. Uh, so for the sequence token, you are putting it through the stack, but you are ignoring the actual prediction by the model. And then you come to this final token of the source sequence. You put something like target semicolon, and then you start generating the NUX token uh, in the same fashion we have seen before. Yeah. So encoder, decoder, and decoder only are very alike. Uh, the difference being that when with the decoder, you're going to put uh, with the decoder only, you're going to put your source sequence in the decoder and ignore the actual outputs. I mean, by actual outputs, I mean the tokens that the model thinks should come next. You still care about the final representation. That's what you need for uh, attention later on. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that's one option. Um, and yeah, T5 is the other option, which is encoder decoder transformer. Uh, for a while, this was the largest publicly available language model of the size 11 billion. So there is a lot of research that's done with T5, 11 billion. Up to the last year, it's been really, really a common choice in research. And uh, there is a lot of insights about uh, T5. So it, yeah, it's one of the prominent models in the research space. Um, it's been uh, pre-trained with a mix of objectives, which I ignore for a moment because I need to teach you what mask language modeling uh, is. But yeah, one of the objectives was uh, language modeling, uh, but with actually not any uh, any corpus, uh, but rather what you have suggested, like summarization, like they use uh, human annotated data framed that as a sequence to sequence and did uh, conditional text generation. That was one of the uh, objectives and the other one is mass language modeling that we are going to learn next. And this idea of taking actual human annotated task is what we are going to, for pre-training, together with language modeling and huge corpus is the next wave of pre-training and something we'll talk about uh, uh, next week and it's called instruction fine tuned. Okay, now I told a bunch of words that are all probably very vague to you. So let's let's just take a, you know, um, a moment to kind of revisit what we are talking about. We are talking about pre-training. We have said that for that, we need a huge corpus and an objective that doesn't require any human intervention. So far, we have seen an example of that being language modeling, neural language modeling. And, um, and we seen that after pre-training, we do fine tuning. And if we have a pre-trained language model that we want to fine tune, we are 
likely just going to fine tune it as a conditional text generation where the goal is to generate uh, the label words, right? Um, another objective is so-called mask language modeling. And um, if I presented this in a historical order, I would first talk about mask language modeling because it is the pre-training objective that has been used in 2018 for pre-training a model that's called BERT that has started this huge uh, you know, uh, revolution of how we train models, namely pre-training then fine-tuning. Mask language modeling um, uh, is a procedure where you, again, sample some uh, text from your big corpus. And uh, here we have, again, a dot IMDB review. And we then randomly mask 15% of the tokens. So 15%, we don't want to mask too many because then it's going to be hard to recover what those tokens are. So we mask 15% of them. And then we put this mask input into our encoder only transformer. The output of each encoder uh, of the last encoder block will be a representation for every single token in our input we'll get some very contextualized embedding for each token. And then what we're going to do is take each one of the embeddings that are um, corresponding to a mask token, and again, try to predict what was the token on that position. So uh, again, the last layer is, like, is the same as in the next word prediction. You have you're trying to build a, pro a distribution over your vocabulary. So the procedure is exactly the same. And you will get some, some, uh, some distribution. You can compare it to one hot encoding uh, where one is at the position of the token that had indeed appeared in the input text. And you do negative leg likelihood, you get the loss for one of these mask tokens. But we have multiple of them. I said I have 15%. Um, so we are going to have if we had three mask tokens, we are going to end up with three loss values here, which we are going to average to produce a single loss for our gradient descent. And that's what mask language modeling is. It's just another way to, um, to um, pre-train this uh, model by using this large corpus. Um, okay, so, when we are done with our pre-training, we have done what I've just described. Um, at the, at the fine-tuning stage, uh, the people who propose BERT have proposed to put a special token called CLS token, CLS for classification, to the beginning of your input sequence. So here you have a sentence, a visually stunning rumination on love. You will then, in your pre-processing, just uh, add the CLS token in here at the beginning and so-called separator token at the end of your sequence. And then the procedure stays the same. Separator token is now part of vocabulary, so it's going to get its index. And everything else uh, stays the same in regards of our transformer. Except that uh, now, with the uh, with fine tuning our mask language modeling pre trained model, instead of um, sorry, just skip so many slides, but instead of having the using the output matrix and um, that we had during pre training uh, and trying to generate the next token which represents the label, here we are going to add new layer in a fine tuning stage. We take the weights, but we ditch the their output metrics, which is of the size hidden dimension times number of words in vocabulary. We don't want to use that. Instead, we introduce new parameters. We introduce a new matrix, which is of the size hidden dimension times number of classes we have, which is for us two because we are doing binary classification. So um, this is maybe the another way to kind of illustrate it. You use BERT's weights. And you get token representation, uh, excuse me, hidden representation for each token in the input. That's what you use BERT for, the mask language modeling uh, model. And then you can think about new parameters you are adding as your model two. And your model two is just this uh, linear transformation, right? Into, into a two vector of the size of the labels we have. 
However, um, when we are doing backpropagation, we backpropagate through all the weights, including the birds weights. So it's not great to think about them as two separate models. Um, because in the end, you are in a fine tuning stage that's just like a single model for you. Um, yeah, and you know, once once we have the output metrics of the uh, size we need, we are going to get the vector of the size of the number of labels. We apply softmax, and everything else stays the same. The issue with this is that the values in this matrix must be learned. For, um, e for each new task from scratch during the fine tuning stage. So if you wanna do classification of uh, sentiment labels, you have one output metrics. If you wanna do topic classification in 10 classes, you have another output metrics and so on. And this is good if you care about a single task and there is nothing wrong with caring about a single task. You know, You might want to build a specific application. Your application can be costed as a classification and this would be perfectly reasonable approach to solve that task. However, what has happened in NLP and larger AI is that we want these so-called general purpose models that can do all sorts of things like ChatGPT. You can ask ChatGPT to classify sentiment and to determine the topic of a given text, right? So that's what's driven the field. That's this idea of building a general purpose system, but not every single NLP application really needs to have uh, ability to solve every single task from drawing uniforms in LaTeX to, um, I don't know, solving, um, giving diagnosis from a clinical note. So it really depends what you wanna do. Both of these are reasonable choices. Um, that said, people had stopped pre-training uh, encoder-only models to pre-train with mask language modeling objectives. So the weights you are getting from the newer age uh, pre-trained language models are simply uh, better for many things. So um, it's always good, I think, if you have, you know, you, you care about a single task and that task is a classification task, I think it's the best for you as a practical advice. Um, to try both, you know, fine tuning BERT in this fashion or better versions of BERT. For example, the BERTA version th three large is a good uh, version of BERT. Um, you do that and then you also try, um, you know, you take LAMA two weights and you fine tune them or, you know, use them in, a, in another fashion and you compare which gives you a better performance. Uh, it really, I think, depends on what exactly you wanna do. Uh, either of these might be better for your approach. Okay, uh, so BERT is the is uh, what I keep mentioning. It was the first model that has been pre-trained in this fashion, and the first model that had shown this massive, I mean, massive improvements in standard NLP task in 2018 and had started. Uh, there, there has been another pre-trained model uh, called Elmo, but uh, BERT really gained those improvements that were so impressive that uh, everything was uh, kind of kicked off. Uh, Roberta, uh, BERT was producing Google. Roberta was producing uh, then called Facebook, and uh, it's just a more optimized version of BERT. Uh, they have ablated certain components of BERT, for example, mask language modeling wasn't only a pre-training objective that uh, BERT authors have used. They also use next sec sentence prediction. I don't even want to describe what it is because the Roberta people have showed that it's not important. So this is what um, th this is what uh, has happened in Roberta. It's basically bird but optimized. And I, I, I very clear have seen that very often also has better performance. And then the Berta is um, th these folks have changed architecture architecture, made architectural changes, um, like they changed something in attention. I don't remember what exactly, but the Berta comes in several versions. The, late, the last version is version three. And uh, all of these models come in base and large sizes, which are around 100 and 300 million parameters. Uh, and the Berta version three large is what I have found to be the best among uh, bert like models. Um, so try to use these better versions of Bird because unfortunately, because BERT is so famous, people had continued to using 
bird when all these better versions exist. Uh, so um, really, if you need to use one of these encoder only mask language model pre-trained models, use the Berta version three. Um, and yeah, issue with the uh, encoder only models, models that are pre-trained in this fashion is that they do actually do not work very well for text generation task. So you wanna do a summarization, summarize a text uh, given article, you can't do it really well with BERT-like models. So you wanna do translation, you can't do them really well with BERT-like models. You really need those encoder, decoder, or decoder only uh, models for generation. And that's uh, maybe now going back to like why uh, encoder only versus these other options. Um, these other options are better because they can do both classification and generation. So uh, you get to do more tasks. But then again, if you know you are going to care only about classification, nothing wrong with using uh, using this. Um, any questions? Would you like me to repeat anything? Because I let said a lot. Yeah. For example, can you take like some journey and journey like a sentence? Like label it as a German sentence and like somehow like back back propagate get like from like, like from just like people like kind of back to like back to like like this model in English to German Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I see. Um, yeah, so you can do that. Um, yeah, you train a model for English to German, and your question is, can you reuse the same model to now do um translation from German to English? Yeah. So back propagation won't give you that, but there is a procedure called back translation where um, you are translating from um, back to the to the source, uh, like from German to English. Um, I'm trying to see whether back translation could be used for your uh, for what you're trying to do, and I don't think so because then you would still need German to English model. So sorry, no, what I was mentioning will not be useful for what you what you are trying to achieve. Um, um, yeah, I don't think you can. So back propagation doesn't have uh, is not a way to do this, but it has been shown that if you train on certain pair languages and then um, you have another language that hasn't been really seen during your you know training, that you can do really well on those languages. And um, there are a few reasons for that. First of all, uh, documenting large data is really hard. And you know, Google had made the mistake repeatedly of claiming, we can now translate in an unseen language. And then someone was like, well, in your data, you actually have that language. You just didn't check you know, carefully uh, enough. Uh, but there is this idea of transfer learning. And I didn't mention this, and I should have. Uh, uh, when we do pre-training, um, actually that comes in my next slide. When we do pre-training, we are acquiring some kind of knowledge that then is useful for the uh, whatever task we care about. And this is called transfer learning. You're kind of transferring knowledge you learn for one task, namely language modeling in pre-training into a whole other task like sentence oh. classification. So if you have languages that are very alike, um, I can speak for again, let's say Croatian and uh, maybe another Slavic language like Bulgarian share a lot of similarities. So um, you, if I train on Croatian or whatever, let's say Croatian, then I maybe acquire knowledge that's super helpful for also translating from Bulgarian to another language. So I just need slightly less data. But the, the idea of not having any data in another language and being used, you still being able to translate that language is is um, really hard. I. I don't now feel very confident to say that no one has done it, but even if they have done it, I am I would be suspicious what are the reasons that they could be able to do it because of that documentation depth that I mentioned before.
Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, as I said just now, uh, there is this idea of transfer learning, and I will, I need to put this phrase somewhere because it's really important uh, to know this idea that during pre training, you or I mean, what, through whatever procedure, you acquire knowledge that then transfers to another task. In us, for us, pre training task was language modeling, and we have acquired all of these useful features uh, that are now useful for uh, another task. We never told the model explicitly, hey, you should be learning syntax. Hey, you should be learning lexical semantics. We have never said this to the model explicitly, but because the model had to predict the next word, this information was useful for it to learn from the data. So the model had implicitly learned these linguistic features. And there is this paper I recommend reading that says that Bird discovered so-called classical NLP pipeline. We will go over the classical NLP pipeline later in the course after the spring break. But basically what this paper shows is that, yeah, the standard features we deem important for solving NLP tasks were acquired during pre-training and now the model can use them during fine tuning. Also worth to mention is that uh, these models are deep, right? We have uh, maybe 12 uh, encoder blocks. Um, at the end, the final blocks are specialized for language modeling. And that's not, these features are not super useful for sentiment classification. So what you will see is that uh, the, the features that are really useful to the model that people have shown are usually in the middle of the, of the transformer. Uh, also then what all gets overridden a lot, like which weights change uh, during fine tuning are usually those that are in higher levels because those in deeper layers are not super important for the task that's not language modeling. So those weights get uh, get to change more. So yeah, this is just a small uh, reminder. And that's also why this, again, uh, why now we are going back to our non convex optimization. Now you are uh, in this space where you are, you know, capturing features that are really uh, important for the language. So, um, I mean, it's really hard to visualize this, of course, because we are working with very high dimensional spaces. But uh, you can imagine that you are, if you have like uh, valleys of not think about mountains and uh, solutions, the good weights for your many tasks you care about are in the small, some neighborhood of that mountain. Basically, what you did with pre-training is uh, kind of came close to that spot. So yeah, break training is is like our solution to this issue. I mean, none of these are really like hundred percent solutions, but we the the way why pre training works, the way it works, uh, why it helps so much, and why no one now would deem in there like no one will use a randomly initialized model anymore is because because we are fixing this. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about pre-training data. Uh, these are a bunch of uh, almost like digressions, I would say, and maybe um, I, I want to talk about these topics maybe later on in the course. As I mentioned before, we'll have these um, you know sessions about responsible AI, uh, but it's a good time to also mention some of these things. So the first thing I you know you might wonder about, which I never talked about, is uh, how is the data selected. Uh, first of all, BERT was pre-trained on like a uh, book corpus, a corpus of, I think, um, books that uh, Google had acquired through Google Books um, or maybe some other, like, I don't now that I said that, I don't believe it's like Google had to do anything with that corpus. So ignore this. It's a corpus of books. Uh, Wikipedia articles, uh, very common is to take the archive uh, preprints uh, and so on. So you take all of these collections and then uh, the, the scrape of the web from the common crawl. But it's a, it's a you know, we, we know that the data we feed to the model is very important. So, uh, you know, before pre-training, bef when we had reasonably sized models, we could inspect this data, we could select portions of it within will be uh, you know, um, will make the model converge faster and all sorts of things. Like the data we know is mega important. However, with pre-training data, the issue is this is so huge that um, manual inspection is not gonna be sufficient. And even automatic tools can be so slow that you just can't, like um, 
for example, you might want to do uh, uh, embedding similarity between between all of the examples. That's going to be very so very very slow. Um, so you are kind of you have an issue of analyzing the data in the first uh, place. All of these um, companies uh, that are pre-training models know that the pre-training data is crux of it. Like it's a it's a it's really important. So if you open GPT four report. If you open Gemini report and you, if you read their data sections, they're like this short. And that should be a whole like dozens of pages of uh, paper. So they didn't disclose this information because they know it's important for their proprietary reasons. So you don't get that information. And then you might have an idea so of, ah, oh, I really think if I do this kind of filtering, that might have these kinds of effects on the model. But to test that hypothesis, you need to pre-train the model. And that, as I said, costs millions and also lasts for months and you don't have GPUs for it. So you can't really do that. And even those who can, don't do it because they, they themselves don't have money for it. And if they had, maybe they would train their models longer rather than do these ablations. So I love the uh, what Shane says here. So public data choices are largely guided by intuition, rumors, and partial information. And this is really true. Like uh, people who build this uh, are largely guided by talking to each other and sharing information. Um, so analysis are slow. Comparing vector representations doesn't, it's, it's really hard. Finding, uh, there is there are techniques uh, for uh, finding influential examples for your prediction. So you can determine which of the training examples were important. Those things are too slow, as Purbit knows really, <laughs> really well. Um, there are ideas about data filtering. Data filtering itself can be really tricky. Um, you know, I've been pre uh, uh, part of this paper where we have looked into the um, filters that uh, the uh, T5 authors had used. They wanted to filter toxic data, data that's obviously meant to just hurt other people. Uh, but in the process of doing that, because they know that, unfortunately, in online communities, certain uh, certain demo demographics are uh, targeted very often, then in their list of naughty words, they included those demographics, demographics themselves. So for example, you can find that LGBTQ is a forbidden word. But then by doing that, you are also erasing the contents that are made by these communities. Like any web page that's made for these people is going to be discarded uh, by your filtering. So you are erasing marginalized voices by your filtering choices. Um, yeah, but quality filters themselves can improve performance, which is good. Like uh, in this paper, they have shown that if you have a quality filter, uh, that your your performance later on might be uh, better too. But it's really tricky and contraintuitive. They have also found that maybe a reasonable thing you want to do is to just remove all toxic data. Uh, if you do that, uh, then the model itself doesn't didn't learn what's uh, toxic, hurtful content and what's not. And it cannot use that information to decide, I will not produce a toxic content. So if you say to a model that's been pre-trained in only on very clean data, uh, hey, don't generate toxic content, uh, but you kind of design your prompt in a way that might uh, you know, make it spiral into something uh, toxic is gonna do that more than a model that has seen some toxic content. So some things are kind of counterintuitive because we are dealing with machine learning. Um, and then the data itself, people who do do audits of data, bless them, uh, they're, 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 I mean, that's a terrible, terrible job of, uh, you know, uh, paper by uh, Birane et al, uh, great paper, they have shown that a lot of image data sets contain child pornography, and we are all as researchers just using that data, but they had to look at that data, and that's a huge toll on the people who are actually doing that, and people who are usually pay very small money to, to do it. So yeah, pre-training data. Uh, if you do want to do research here, there is uh, lots to do. I, I think... Uh, Developing new algorithms is definitely fancy and you get a lot of prestige for doing it, but doing data work is is mega rewarding and actually can do a huge impact on the field. Um, 
Yeah, so on a, uh, also you might wonder how many pre-training tokens you should be, uh, if you now are given 10 million and you decide to spend them on pre-training a language model, you need to make a decision of how many tokens you want to see during pre-training. Also, when we do pre-training, we just have one epoch, meaning we see uh, one instance only a single time. There is no iterating over data. And uh, there is a line of work called scaling laws in large language modeling community, where you are trying to see how you should, how, what's the ratio of, um, if you are gonna increase your model size tenfold, how, how 10 times, how, how much uh, more training data you should uh, have. And uh, people who have started this line of work, um, all of them are mostly from OpenAI, they have given their first scaling laws. And after that, people have found that those scaling laws are not uh, super precise. And there is a whole line of work that tries to make um, you know, more precise estimates of how you should increase the data and model size. So people uh, who have produced LAMA2 uh, excuse me, not, not those people, the people from DeepMind. They have um, produced this paper. I, we, we refer to it as chinchilla because the word chinchilla is mentioned there, but I forget why. I think they trained a model that's called chinchilla, but they didn't release it, so it's not really used. Mm -hmm. And their whole thing is was to find compute optimal large language models. And what they said is that, well, um, uh, the original scaling law paper suggests that uh, models uh, that the, uh, that, um, that for the 10, uh, excuse me, let me see where am I? The size of the model should increase five times if you increase the budget, but why the number of training tokens should increase only uh, two times. So you are increasing the size of the model two times that you're increasing the size of your data. And what they have found that actually you need to uh, increase them in the same proportion. The effect of that finding was that with way smaller models, they uh, managed to and using more pre-training data, they managed to produce uh, as good models as their way larger um, alternatives. So they showed that with a smaller model, you can actually have way better performance, which was massively important because now very often we use uh, models of the size of 7 billion, where before we thought, okay, you need like, I don't know, dozens of billions. Um, also, as I said before, all of these models are under trained. These are the training curves uh, of uh, LAMA2 model that I mentioned before, and it's different sizes, 7, 13, 34, and 70 billion. I forgot there is 34 billion version. No one uses that one. So uh, yeah, there is a mistake on the slide before. And you can see that none of these actually, actually saturated, like they are all still going downwards. If they converge, then we would see a flatter curve. So all of these models are under trained, which means in practice that you, if you had more money, more GPUs, more data, you could train a better 7 billion uh, model. So when people say a oh, larger model is always better, you should have these nuances uh, in mind as well. All right, how much more I can ramble? Mm -hmm. um, let me see, uh, where, okay. All right, I will leave this for another time because it's an interesting discussion about fair use. Like, uh, you know, this data is scraped from the, from the web and like, uh, uh, you know, you might have seen that New York Times has uh, sued um, OpenAI because uh, OpenAI's models generate New York Times article, which is kind of sad that it took like a huge corporation to sue to actually see the change because many artists have reported this before. Um, but you know, fair argument, fair use argument is really tricky. It's not just about we should forbid using this data, and I'll come to that some other time. What we are going to talk about next is how this pre-training stage became more involved. Uh, it became more involved by doing something called instruction fine-tuning, as I mentioned before. This idea of using human written summary came into a play, uh, and then there is uh, last year Arele Jeff took off which is also using a data produced by people who have given us preferences of which generation they like more. And uh, here, especially people have used preferences for uh, to whether this is more hurtful than the other generation, whether this is more toxic. And that's 
what enables that for the first time we have a chatbot that doesn't immediately start saying very nasty things and we have to shut it down uh, day after. Okay, that's that's it for today. Uh, and see you next week.